Hello, uh, my name is Jose Martin Garcia, and I will be talking about what's new in version 12 of the World from Language in the Geo functionality. So I'm going to talk about what's new in geography. There are many things to talk, so let's start. So the the main functions uh, like um, geographics, geoimage, geolevation data have been um, largely rewritten internally so that uh, uh, the things that are being presented today uh, were implemented and new things that will come next can be implemented. So the underlying uh, or the, the overall uh, idea was that until now, geographics has been controlled mostly by properties of ranges on the Earth, like ranges of latitudes and longitudes, etc. So that was very intuitive, very simple to use. However, the maps that you got uh, in output sometimes were not exactly what you wanted. Because if you just started with a square range of latitudes and longitudes, that didn't mean that the final map would be a square. right? So, there is an alternative way of controlling the maps, which is controlling the details of the final projected ranges and final projected positions. And so what you will see here is how the new functions have been extended and improved to follow that idea. So the first one that we are going to see is GeoImage. So for example, uh, GeoImage was introduced in version 11.2. And um, if you ask for a, a GeoImage of a map of Turkey, say, let me put this a bit bigger. So you get that map, right? So now we have the new option aspect ratio, which is one of the many new options that your image gained. And now you can just say, give me a square map, and this map will be exactly square. And this, is, this will happen in any projection. It doesn't matter which projection you would use. The map will be a square. You can control also the maps simply by saying, I want in the projected space, again, this size, so this many pixels, so if you ask for the image di dimensions of that image, you get exactly what you wanted. And we can also even control independently the image size, so how you see it in screen, and you see it's the same size as before, as before and the actual raster size that uh, the image uh, has internally. So if you ask now for image dimensions, you get 300, 300. Okay, so as I was saying, something very important is to control maps by projected ranges. So let me show you here, this is the UTM grid. So this is a projection, a universal transverse Mercator projection that divides the Earth on these 60 bands, 60 stripes, and each of them is very good, very little uh, distortion on the area it covers, up to the, the poles. Right? So you can imagine like having these stripes that cover the Earth from pole to pole, and you have 60 of them. They are completely disjoint on the equator, but if you see here as Valvard, for example, it appears multiple times, right? Because near the poles, they overlap with each other. So, for example, we selected the point for Chicago. So Chicago appears only in this one, which is band number 16. That tooltip is saying 16. So we know that if we want to work around Chicago, it's good to use the UTM zone 16. So that's the coordinates of Chicago in the UTM zone 16. And this is expressed in meters because distortion is very low in these uh, this bands. We can actually use meters. And so for example, now we can say, give me a map of Chicago with a, you see, now we don't say geo range. We say geo grid range. We are explicitly asking for the projected uh, ranges. And we, we say, uh, this is the number of meters from the left uh, side of the band, and this is the number of meters from the equator, right? So that, because the, these two ranges are the same in, in size, we get a square map, and we have the ticks here expressed in meters. So this is exactly, uh, or, or very approximately uh, 20 kilometers and 20 kilometers. And you can do the same thing in geo image, right? So you can ask for, uh, you can specify the UTM SOM 16, and give me the map of this geo grid, uh, this geo grid range. So this projection is very uh, used. For example, the military grades are based on this projection. Um, the, the military grids are based on this projection. And the third thing about uh, geo image 
you know that uh, in GeoImage, we have access to very good uh, resolution satellite imagery. And every, uh, this is something that the uh, Wolfram uh, research pays for. And every user has a free quota of digital globe tiles per month. So please use it. We need to evaluate how, uh, how useful this is. And if you don't use it one month, it's lost. So all the counters are, are reset for the next month. So I invite you to, to use it. So this is, um, for example, an image of the Adler Planetarium here in Chicago. And we have this new option also to say, I want a resolution of three feet. This is the average distance pixel to pixel. Right? So you don't have to worry about zoom levels and things like that. Um, it depends on, on, the, on the equator or the poles, right? So in the equator, which is the, 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 the worst situation, we can get some 15 even lower than a meter, below a meter, around a feet. Uh, and then as you go up in latitudes, it gets better and better. There's a cosine factor. Okay, next function, uh, geolevation data. Geolevation data bef uh, had three options until now. And uh, it has 15 now. So uh, it, it's a much more powerful function now. Uh, though GeoServer is still is, is there, but it's, it can only connect uh, to our server at the moment. So in the future, it will be extended as well. So for example, what we were doing until now is using always the geoprojection uh, equirectangular, because that's what the data is originally in. So if you ask for, say, Alaska, and I'm choosing explicitly a, a region which is quite north, you got, you got something like this, which is highly distorted. So now you can do as in geographics, you can say choose automatically the projection, or you can choose any projection you want, and now you get a much uh, more faithful uh, representation of the area. And for example, you can use that data, which is, comes as a, as a quantity array, as usual, or in, in feet or meters, depending on where you are. And now you can, you see, uh, see this, this 3D region of um, the representation of the um, okay, of the area uh, here, mm -hmm. right? And this is the the proper thing that you would need to uh, if you want to three D print it or something. You have to have this region, the, the, this representation. Um, yes, something to stress here is that because the, uh, the array representation and the representation needed by these functions is the opposite, you always need to use a reverse here. Don't forget that because otherwise you will get orientations wrong. And sometimes when the map is very local, you don't, you don't uh, realize it. For example, Stephen always forgets that and he always get, gets uh, at the Everest mountain clips. Okay, or, or you can use data reversed. Either, either of those you have to use. Um, yeah, you can, if you are very interested in the actual positions of each of those uh, values of elevation, you ask for a geoposition object and you get these uh, more than half a million points, values, all tagged with their respective location. Next slide. For example, now we can do Antarctica, right? Because this can choose any projection. So, so we can have um, an azimuthal projection for Antarctica. So, so this is quite nice as well. Or um, we can choose, we can add a scaling function, uh, sorry, a color function. And yeah, so this, this uh, color function, which is special for, for elevations, which takes into account the sign. And um, yeah, and so this is the region around the North Pole. And so you see here uh, Greenland, and that would be Canada, and Alaska, and Russia, and Scandinavia. So yeah, so this is all new, and uh, of course we can use uh, all the new options. You can we can control this by grid ranges. We can control also the actual size of the array we want back. So the, say 500 by 500. So that's what you get. Uh, we, we can use exactly like geographics. Use the choose the center, choose the range. A lot of flexibility on how to choose uh, the elevation. Okay, something we have added as well is uh, random geoposition. So now we can uh, um, evaluate random geoposition. By default, it gives you uh, a geoposition uh, anywhere on the Earth. 
And the first argument can be either specification of number or dimensions if you want an array or the region. We can say give me a point, a random geoposition in the United States or give me 100 or 500 geopositions randomly. Uh, and by default, they are uniformly distributed on area, in area, right? So we get that 10. Or for example, remember that if you want to include Alaska and Hawaii, you have to use a geo variant that says give me the principal area. If you want to include other things like one, etc., you would have to use all areas. But now we can also get uh, the points distributed uh, and included, including there is a point here. So again, the projection is fundamental here because uh, when we ask for, say, a thousand uh, random geopositions over the world, those, for example, appear uniformly distributed in equal area projections, like these four. The first four are equal area projections. And you see, they are exactly the same points, and they all look uniform in all projections. However, if you go to other types of projections, like this is a rectangular or Mercator, you see they don't look uh, uniform at all, right? Because there is a lot of space in the Mercator projection around the poles. So if you want points that look uh, uniform in the Mercator projection, you have to specify it. You have to specify the projection in which you want uniformity. And now, for example, we get back a thousand points again, but in the equal area projections, they, they accumulate a lot around the points, uh, around the poles. And even in the rectangular projections, they don't look right. But in Mercator projections, they will look correct. Right? So you can choose which projection you want to uh, have uniformity in. Another thing that we have added is uh, ways of extracting information from geoposition. And uh, so it now has all these properties. So you can extract latitude and longitude. You can extract latitude, longitude, or because sometimes this is what is needed. You can extract longitude, latitude. You can get information which is not explicitly there, but it's implicitly there. So that, like the default datum we always use, even if you don't know you are using a datum. Elevation, by default, when you don't use a geoposition, it's assumed to be on the ellipsoid. So elevation zero with respect to the ellipsoid. And geopositions actually store events, events in space time. So they also have a date. You can specify as a fourth element of the list, you can specify uh, uh, an absolute time in, uh, in GMT. And so the date by default is now. Yeah? If you don't specify, they assume it, it to be now. Uh, you can ask for the number of points you have, if they are packed, which, uh, which is the packing type they are using. And this is also done for every type of geoposition, like geoposition X, Y, Z. So we can extract various co uh, co combinations of the values. Remember that these are um, coordinates in meters with respect to a frame centered at the center of the Earth and oriented with respect to Greenwich. And the and the North Pole. And other objects also gain properties like geo displacements, right? So if we have a geo displacement of a thousand miles uh, in the north northeast direction, so the, the angle uh, arguments in the geographics uh, framework are able to understand these notations or the by notation like northeast by north and things like that. And yeah, this is, you have various properties here. Okay, more things, something completely new, geo vectors. So this is a new flavor of a geodetic object. And it's, it's, a, it's a bit like a, like a Gaussian to geo position. The most important thing to realize from the very beginning is that these are not geo primitives, right? You need to wrap them around with something to convert them into something you can plot in a map. Same thing as with your position. If you put your position in a map, you will not see a point or a marker or anything. You have to wrap around it, point or your marker or whatever. Same thing is going to happen with your vector. So your vector has also four flavor uh, in parallel to your position itself. So you, we have your vector, your vector ENU, your vector XYZ, and your grid vector. And they follow the same type of coordinate system that your position itself uh, is following. So for example, the ENU means east, north, up. So that's the frame that's tangent at a given location. 
or the XYZ. So this is a frame that is oriented with respect to the XYZ frame of the Earth itself. So for example, what's an example here? So we can ask geomagnetic model data for uh, the value of the magnetic uh, field, vector field, here now, because remember the magnetic field is something quite alive, and uh, we get back this. So the structure of geo vector is always the same. It says this is the position and this is the value of the vector. The vector here in this case is a vector in nano Teslas, but it can have any units. It can be a velocity, it can be an acceleration, it can be a flow of migration, whatever. Right? So you can have any, any uh, coordinate, any unit. The ENU form means this is the east component, the north component, uh, sorry, e, yes, the north component and the up component. So in this case, we see that uh, the, the fundamental part of the magnetic field here is vertical and pointing downwards. And um, GeoVector is another of these flavors. It acts as a container as a, an, an, as a converter, exactly like your position. So we can convert this. It will keep the position exactly in the same way. But now we have the vector in a different form. So now it's some sort of cylindrical form. So we have this is the a norm of the horizontal part. That's the bearing, remember? Angle with respect to north clockwise in degrees. And that's the vertical part, which is the same. So we see here, for example, that here the magnetic field is not pointing exactly north. It's pointing a bit to the west, three degrees. And so now we want to plot it in a map. So we use GeoMarker. So GeoMarker can take uh, vectors, and because they are vectors, it will draw arrows. The second argument is a vector marker argument, and it has the full freedom that uh, Brett was explaining yesterday for uh, the uh, vector plot. So we can have here darts and drops and all these, all these things that the vector marker allows. And so you, so you see this, this vector is a bit tilted to the, to the left. Now, the, the important thing from the point of view of geographics is that if we use any other projection, of course, the, vet, the vectors are going to know what, are, what is their proper uh, direction. And so here you see how north is now pointing in that direction. And so the vector is pointing in that direction. So this is all automatic. All, all, every um, rotation, change of norm, et cetera, will be controlled by geographic itself via the projection. Um, so the vector can be 2D or 3D. And um, here I have uh, a manipulate in which well, we don't need to, to look at the code. The important thing here is that we, I want to compare the difference between a vector, which is here, and I'm choosing here, I don't know, miles per hour. You see, it doesn't have to be a distance. With a geopath, a geopath is, is a true displacement on the Earth. It's a distance-based displacement, right? So we have something like two th uh, yeah, 2,500 miles. However, the vector can have the same direction, but the, the norm is completely in a different frame, right? And so, yeah, so here you see the difference. So the vector is pointing in the same direction as the, as the geopath, but of course the interpretation is quite different. And um, if we go to Mercator, so in the Mercator projection, uh, we have similar situation, or in the Lambert asymmetric projection, in which uh, disks or circles look uh, properly Circular. Okay, um, as I was saying, geographics will control all uh, changes in, in direction, etc. So here we have this frame, the, the vector pointing its east, the vector pointing north, and then some arbitrary vector that, right? Okay, so if I change this to say this position and uh, I do this, you see how the vector is changing in, in norm. So because this is a perspective, well, this is a projection that we understand uh, visually, we understand what's happening here. However, if we go to say, I don't know, Lambert asymmetral and we try to play the same game, so here it's not intuitive at all 
what should happen. Uh, so when the vector is going to become shorter or when the vector is going to become longer, etc. And uh, geographics will control that for you. So uh, everything related to the projection. You can have many ve many vector. So we now have say random geoposition of a hundred points and a hundred vectors. Right? This will this will kind of uh, collect all the vectors at the same location. And so we see that they are mostly all uh, oriented towards north. And those represent the geomagnetic model, uh, the, geoma the geomagnetic vector field uh, in the area of Canada. You see they are pointing towards some place there, which is where, where the, the vector field dips and it becomes more or less vertical. And yeah, th that also explains why the vectors are getting shorter because this is the horizontal projection, right? So the vectors in this area are almost vertical. And you can plot many vectors. You see the difference between using geo vector directly and using geo vector plot or geo stream plot is that with geo vector, we will plot the vectors at their position. With geo vector plot, some sort of smoothing will be done and then you will get a, a, a kind of a complete vector field. You can control sizes, colors, everything. Okay, I have two more minutes. And the last thing we have added is uh, geo distortion and scales. So the idea here is, well, how much is the, my projection distorting things? So to understand this, we have to understand that in order to go from the earth to the map, there are three steps. First, we choose a datum, which is some sort of very good approximation to the Earth, but keeping the right size. Then we go from the datum to our reference model. This is also called a generating globe in the literature, globe in the, in the literature. And here we perform a shrinking factor. This is what in the maps they usually write uh, like one colon a hundred thousand. So that's the nominal scale, right? So that's that's this step of going from the datum to the reference model. And finally, from the reference model, which is still an spheroid we go to a flat map. And in this step, we don't change scales, but it gets very distorted. So when we talk about scales in a map, we are combining two things, the global sinking factor, the nominal scale, and the distortion at a point. This is constant, this is point independent. Okay? So these three new functions control both things for the three fundamental uh, objects we are always worried in geo, which is distance, area, and direction. And when we go to geo 3D, we will add volume here. So, for example, what's what's the um, so we have this function geogrid unit distance that reports that in the Mercator projection around Copenhagen in the direction forty five degrees, we have like forty miles. That means that in this map, if we go to the Mercator projection from Copenhagen forty miles. That is basically the same distance as a, as a tick here, right? So you, you can understand this number as one of my ticks, the distance corresponding to a tick in a map is 40 miles in reality around that point. And this will depend from point to point, right? So this is controlling the, the distance uh, distortion around that point. So we can do the same thing with area. So and this is quite useful, for example, when you want to do operations on the projected space. Imagine that you say, I have this map of Venus, and, and I have this disk, and I want to compute the true area on the Earth. So what we have to do is to integrate these on the projected coordinates, but taking into account the conversion factor of area, right? Yeah. So I, uh, we have this function, which is computing the numbers that we have here, just convert it into kilometers squared. And then we can integrate the area of this disk and get kilometers squared back. But you see, this is a computation performed in projected, uh, this is not a geodisk, it's a true disk in projected space. But with this, we can do any type of operation, and this is like the area element of the integration, right? So it has the, this name, so it's more intuitive what's going on. And then there is a, finally another function to control distortion of, of, uh, of angles, which basically saying, oh, these two vectors were originally orthogonal, but now they are not by this difference. So it's telling you how many degrees they go together or more separated. For conformal projections like Mercator, there is no distortion, and this is always zero. Okay, so I conclude here with a slide about 
many things to do in the future. So we want to enter elevation in all uh, the um, full details, including vertical datums. We want to add many more uh, protocols uh, of communications in GeoServer to, act, to access a lot more information. Of course, we have the new uh, great uh, technology for polygons with holes, so we want to use that in Geo. We want to start moving geographics toward vector data. And vector mea means here opposed to raster data, starting with labels. In projection land, we have to do oblique uninterrupted projections. And then, of course, more geo data, the geo part of the spatial statistics that the statistics uh, group is, is developing, and astrographics, yeah, a full new project linked to geo. Thank you.